Chris Black, SC Animation, and Max DJ's Workshop all requested that I do Pterodactyl. I don't have a Pterodactyl, but I have a Pteranodon, so we're going to talk about Pteranodon. Uh, incidentally, uh, Pterodactyl is not the name of Pterodactylus, the genus, uh, so people tend to use Pterodactyl to mean any pterosaur, and specifically they'll refer to Pteranodon as a Pterodactyl, especially in America, because it's an American dinosaur, also it's ten times larger than a Pterodactyl, so it's clearly better. Um, so you could make a case that Pterodactyl would refer to any pterosaur. Science certainly did that for a while there. Disclaimer, it was not a dinosaur. It was an archosaur, which I'm told, I, I've been pronouncing that wrong. I keep saying archosaur, but it's archosaur, which makes complete sense because of the word root. I just never thought about it. It generally gets lumped in with dinosaurs in the popular consciousness, and unlike with, you know, Dimetrodon or Woolly Mammoth or whatever, it actually makes sense to lump pterosaurs in with dinosaurs because, you know, first off, they were phylogenetically very close. They were archosaurs that were arguably closer to dinosaurs than to crocodiles. The current theory is that they were ornithodirans. They emerged as highly specialized uh, archosaurs during the early to mid Triassic became extremely specialized and very large uh, by the late Cretaceous and then died off in the, the KT extinction event. So they're not dinosaurs, but it's, they're technically not dinosaurs, whereas a lot of creatures that get lumped in there, you would be like, no, that is clearly not a dinosaur. Close. Speaking of the KT extinction event, that's when a big ol' asteroid smashed into Mexico and killed most life on Earth. You've probably heard about it. That's why we're here. This toy is extremely inaccurate. Uh, I'm not sure where to start about telling you what's wrong with it, but I could tell you what's right about it. Um, it does have an accurate number of fingers and toes. It has, uh, well, kind of. It seems to be lacking wing fingers, but it has three uh, normal carpal, uh, metacarpals and four toes on each foot. Uh, its feet are plantigrade, which is they're, they're walking on their heels, which is what they did. Uh, it, it doesn't have teeth. You'll frequently see Pteranodon portrayed with teeth just to make it more fearsome. No, the, the name Pteranodon means toothless wing or wing without teeth because uh, they had to work the Ptero in there. But this one doesn't have teeth, so that's cool. Uh, oh, the head is more or less perpendicular to the neck and the body, which is also accurate. They carried their heads down as opposed to like straight out. You'll see uh, Pteranodon portrayed with its head straight out like in Ajdarkid or whatever, but... Mm. Uh, oh, right, and it's it's covered in uh, this fur-like thing. The term is pinka fibers. They're, they're dense filaments. I don't know if they're analogous to the protofeathers that you see in dinosaurs and other archosaurs, but they're visually similar. Uh, I also don't know, I don't think anyone really knows, uh, the extent to which Pteranodon would have been covered in these things. It would have been useful for uh, a marine creature to have uh, complete coverage, but we're, we're just not sure. Not a lot of soft tissue for Pteranodon in particular. To get into what's wrong with it, I guess we should start with posture, because that's the first thing that strikes me. There would be very little reason for Pteranodon to ever strike this particular pose, where it's on its hind legs, but on the ground with its wings outstretched. First off, when it was on the ground, it was quadrupedal. So the toy maker really can't be excused for giving it a tripodal stance. I, un I, I sort of understand giving a theropod a tripodal stance because there's sort of a, uh, a restorative, restorative precedent for that. But Pteranodon would be a quadruped if it was on the ground. And I suppose you can make the case that, oh, it's actually supposed to be flying. But if it's supposed to be flying, why didn't you just make the feet out backwards like it's flying? Why would you make it able to be stood up at all. 
Oh, and you might argue that it would strike this pose if it was trying to like take off. No. Uh, Pteranodon, all pterosaurs, the, the current theory based on their biomechanics is that they, because they were quadrupeds on the ground, they would have launched not with their weak little hind limbs, but with their extremely powerful forelimbs, which is completely different to anything else that's flying around today, where they push themselves into the air. They actually had something approaching, like the, the tendon in their wrist was really crazy, and it, it, it was almost a catapult, or a, I guess technically it would be an onager. Uh, in each wrist to launch itself into the air and then bring its arms up and then flap down to, to get completely airborne. And it, it, that's really cool and it's completely not reflected in this toy. And you might ask, how do I know that they were quadrupedal when they were on the ground? Aside from the fact that paleontologists told me so. Uh, we have trackways from this creature. And I always get a little excited about footprints, but in this case it's cool because Initially, we thought that these particular trackways were from like crocodiles, but upon further analysis, it's a pterosaur walking on its wings. And the hands were on the ground, but the wing finger was held aloft. And then the body would have been almost erect, especially for long-winged creatures like, like Pteranodon. Uh, and another thing from the trackways is the stride. Uh, they were not slow on their feet, like, like a lot of portrayals are. They, 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 they could get a decent stride on the ground. They weren't exactly graceful, but they could move. So regarding the scaling of the creature, for starters the wings are way too small. We're going to transition to, into how it would be proportioned if it were flying, by the way, because on the ground you don't see the geometry so well. But the head is too small also. The body is too big and the head is too small. So. Head should be as long as the neck and the body put together. The neck should be about equal length with the body. And then the legs should be another body length. Altogether, like, based on the crest, I would assume this is an adult and a female. So we're looking at a five foot creature or the size of a large albatross. Whereas if it were male, it would be a lot bigger. It would have, as opposed to a 12 foot wingspan for a female, a 20 foot wingspan for a male and probably eight feet long. So that's like the size of a giant pteratorn. Okay, more like a medium pteratorn. And if you don't know what a pteratorn is, what are you doing with your life? There was a place to see vulture, it was huge. Just look it up, I'll probably put a link somewhere. Meanwhile, the tail. They have, in order to give it the fallacious freaking tripod stance, they have given it this absurdly long, it's not even a rampharynchid tail because it's all snaky. So Pteranodon's tail, it was a pterodactyloid, which among other things means that its tail was very small. Uh, it also wouldn't have been very flexible. The, the anterior half of it would have been pretty flexible, but the posterior half was just this one solid rod. And we're not sure why. Um, as a pterodactyloid, it had membranes between the uh, legs, but we're not sure if the membranes went all the way to the tip of the tail or maybe just stopped at the base of the tail. Just not sure. It, it would be cool if like the rod was part of the flight membrane and that was like a control surface. That would be cool. Um, mentioned the head earlier, it should have the bill curved upwards, not, not down like it is. And, and it should, the top bill should be significantly longer than the bottom bill. And this might be because it's a toy and they don't want to put a bunch of sharp points on it, but it, 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 it was a really sharp point on the end of a pteranodon's bill. The eyes are a little too far down and a little too far. I know that it looks like they're sort of not even in the head anymore, but the pterosaur skulls are weird. They should practically be in the crest, like they should be up and back. Uh, and it has eyebrow ridges. Eyebrow ridges. Get rid of those. No eyebrow ridges. And I've been saving the wings for last because that's the first thing that struck me when I looked at this. The wings are terrible. This has sort of two sickles nailed to the sides of its body, and there's a lot wrong with that. Uh, first off, they should just be bigger. The, the 
I mentioned scale earlier, 20 foot wings on an eight foot creature, that's a really high, they call it aspect ratio for, for flying creatures and for airplanes. I also mentioned albatross earlier for scaling. Albatross is a really apt comparison because not only was it, I mean, albatrosses are heavy gliders like pteranodon. Um, lifestyle wise, it was also similar to an albatross, at least as far as we figure, because we mostly find it in um, what was the interior North American seaway uh, during the Cretaceous. And we find them in areas where they would have been hundreds of miles offshore in some cases. So these were very much marine creatures, uh, uh, like an albatross. It has these sharp tips on the end. It, it should have rounded tips because it messes up the aerodynamics. As far as how they're attached to the legs, these have a, this toy has it stopping at the knee, essentially, which could be accurate. We're not sure where it, where it attached. It, it definitely did sort of a sharp turn down when it attached to the legs, but it might have attached to the ankle for all we know. I think ankle sounds cooler, especially since that makes the uh, membrane in between the legs a lot uh, more relevant. It appears to completely lack a wing finger, and that's a problem. <laughs> the The arms altogether are just incorrect. They they. It's sort of a bat up until you hit the wrist, and that's not good. Instead of having the long radius, it should have a long carpal. In fact, the carpal was longer than the radius. Uh, uh, really, not this sharp, almost right angle transition from the arm to wing. It was, it was very gradual. And the fingers should not be pointing at a right angle. They should be outwards. In fact, the first finger was the shortest. They sort of increased in length as you went. The first finger was short, second finger a little longer, third finger a little longer, fourth finger as long as the rest of the arm put together. It also, it has a membrane on the leading edge of the wing in front of the arm, but it, does, it seems to lack a, a pteroid bone to be controlling it. That's a bone unique to pterosaurs. We're not sure what it uh, corresponds to in other creatures, if anything. Uh, it could be a metacarpal, it could be a carpal. Uh, it controlled the leading edge of the wing, so it's really important for a flying creature. One more note on the fingers. They might have been webbed. We're not sure. Uh, other pterosaurs have webbed fingers and webbed toes. Uh, pterodactyl had webbed toes, I'm pretty sure. It's also committing this fallacy that you see everywhere about pterosaurs, that they were sort of skin and bones, basically a flying kite. Not true. They were heavily muscular. Uh, uh, this wouldn't have had to, you know, jump off cliffs to take off. It wouldn't have had to, like, wait for the right wind to be able to sort of lazily drift into the air. It was a powered flyer. It was a very heavy flyer, actually. A lot more of its muscle mass was in its arms than, well, arms and legs, uh, than a corresponding weight-wise terrestrial creature would have had, just because its arms and legs were so much longer. The breathing apparatus on these guys would not have been as we know it with a diaphragm breathe in breathe out it would be more like a bird where it's sort of a pump that continuously circulates air throughout a bunch of sacs and, and airways throughout the creature that sort of acted as a transition between the hard surfaces the bones and the and the tendons and the muscles of the the arms and the the actual flight surfaces of the wings. So there was no hard defining line between arm and wing. It was it was a wing. Is probably if you take one thing away from this video, it's that. It wasn't these leathery flaps of skin either. The the structure of the wing, we don't have any living analogs and we have just tantalizing evidence of whenever you see like shale or, or the, the Bavarian quarries keep turning up these uh, uh, trace fossils of, of crushed skeletons with, with the, the, the membranes still visible in the rock. And we're so unclear about how they actually went together. There's um, these fibers that go on the, the, the further you get from the creature, the, you see these fibers radiating out towards the edges of the wing. Uh, there's a specific name for them that I'm blanking on, but they're these dense little radiating fibers. Uh, they, they sort of look like coarse hairs, but really long. So it would be, I don't know how rigid it was. Nobody really knows how rigid they would have been. They would have deformed under load because that's the nature of having wings made of flesh. 
but not these bat-like membranes that you usually see on the, the reconstructions. I forgot to mention the feet. They're, uh, they're not bad, incidentally. Like I said, they have the accurate number of toes, but uh, the toes should get longer the further from the center of the creature you get. Uh, and the back of the foot didn't have quite as much of a pad as they're showing on this. Uh, it would have been more triangular, I suppose. Again, this is referencing the trackways. I think that's all I can think of to say about Pteranodon. Uh, thank, I hope this answered your pterodactyl-related questions as well. Thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Uh, please like, comment, subscribe, uh, suggest dinosaurs for me to talk about. You could even send me a toy dinosaur. Uh, our address is in the description. Uh, go to thegeekgroup.org to find out how you can become a member or donate. We'll see you next time. Something I only recently appreciated is that pterodactyl can also be an adjective. Like, you can say that a wing or a, or, an, or a limb is pterodactyl in the same way that you can say that our hands are pentadactyl. That doesn't really help with clarity as far as pteranodon is not pterodactylus. Also, I kept referring to pterodactylus as pterodactyl anyway, which was not helpful either. But... Words! As you might expect, both Pterodactylus and Pteranodon have a complicated history as names. Way back in the 19th century, Marsh referred the first Pteranodon material to genus Pterodactylus. This was before we'd found a head and knew that it was toothless. Now, Cope, literally days later, published material that we now know to be congeneric with Pteranodon, but assigned it to a different European genus, Ornithochiris, which is sort of closer cladistically, but we didn't know that at the time anyway, and it wound up not mattering because once we found a toothless skull, Marsh erected the genus Pteranodon, which we have to this day. But as expected, when Cope and Marsh weren't arguing with one another, they were erecting more species than the data could actually support, which subsequent workers have had to then sort through. The paper everyone cites is Bennett in 1994, but if that paper exists online, I can't find it. Some of those old species are different genera entirely, but most of them are what is now longiceps, which just means long head, which is appropriate. We also have a second species, Sternbergi, from material recovered in the 60s. The morph of that animal that we call male has a crest that is a very different shape from what we see in longiceps. It's much higher and more blade-like. This too has been considered a separate genus, Geosternbergia. I don't actually know where we're at on that one, but even if it is a separate genus, it is very, very closely related to longiceps. It might even be the anagenetic ancestor of it. I really didn't need to say arguably there. There's no serious dispute that pterosaurs and dinosaurs are more closely related to each other than either is to Pseudosuchia. There is some fuzziness about basal taxa and like the exact categories that certain Triassic animals fall into, but like nothing paradigm shifting. I think the point I was trying to make is that, you know, pterosaurs aren't actually dinosaurs is a neat little, like, trivia tidbit, but what does that actually tell us about these animals? Trying to understand either group is enriched by recognizing that they are closely related to each other, rather than just being straight on focused on dinosaurs or pterosaurs, which a lot of workers have been historically. I should have mentioned, workers actually did find a pterosaur that resembles these toys superficially, the, the pteranodon, but with teeth in its bill. They called it ludodactylus, meaning playfinger, because it looks like the toys. Though, being an unhungwerid, the teeth didn't actually look like that. They, they resemble salad tongs more than anything. <laughs> They're not neat little rows all inside the mouth like this. I meant to say phalanges there, not metacarpals, though Pteranodon does have three normal metacarpals, but they're only normal in comparison to that giant fourth hand bone.
actually, Ejdarkids did not have their heads in line with the neck. Like most derived pterodactyloids, their heads would have been tilted down in normal carriage because of the shape of the back of their skull. I believe throughout the video I pronounced it pinko fibers, even though what I was trying to say was picna fibers, which is a term that still annoys me, but one that I might not have to use much longer. There have been developments as far as the homology between dinofuzz and the structures that we find on pterosaurs, but we're doing us an episode about that, so I'm not going to elaborate here. I feel the need to clarify that when I say that the feet would stick out backwards, I do not <laughs> mean <laughs> like this toy, where they, where they appear to have been d bolted on wrong. <laughs> On the subject of how the animal could take off, there's actually been a lot of interest the last 10 years or so uh, in water launch in pterosaurs. How could these animals push off from the surface of the water and be able to get airborne? Some birds do push off the water with their wings, and workers think that some pterosaurs could have done something like that, though obviously their wings work a little differently. And in Anhanguera, which is roughly the same size as the morph of Pteranodon that we call female, workers think that by doing a series of hops off the surface of the water, getting a little bit higher and a little bit faster each time, it could eventually break free and be able to start flapping flight. So if you've been wondering how could Pteranodon live on the ocean but still be able to fly, that, that's probably how. I keep saying the morph we call male or the morph we call female, that's because we don't have direct evidence. You know, we don't we don't have a pteranodon with eggs inside it, which would clearly indicate that it is female. But we do have two distinct clusters that these animals fall into. We have a large morph that has a big long crest, a much larger body, and a relatively narrow pelvic canal. Conversely, we have a small morph with a smaller body, a short little crest, and a relatively wide pelvic canal. And Bennett argued that ha having a small animal with a wide pelvis, well, that's for laying eggs, clearly. Whereas the difference in the crest size would indicate that, you know, the males with their big pretty crests were in a position of social dominance or competing with each other. I really should have had a graphic comparing the size of Pteranodon to the size of Argentavis, so here is that. Drink it in. So actually, the Europatagia, the membrane that runs probably from the ankle to the hip at the back of the leg, doesn't involve the tail at all in derived pterodactyloids. It appears to run from the pelvis to the ankle. It's got this deep V structure. Interestingly, that albatross comparison doesn't hold up. Albatrosses and petrels use a style of flying called dynamic soaring, which allows them to exploit the air currents that form over the ocean in order to fly very quickly and very long distances for very low energy cost. And a couple different approaches to modeling Pteranodon's flight agree that it would really struggle with that, unless wind speeds were incredibly high. Because, according to these models, Pteranodon would fly with very low air speeds, but also a very low sink rate. Which does mean that they would be able to exploit thermal soaring and slope soaring, which means that they would be more like a, a pelican or a frigate bird than, a, than an albatross or a petrel. Or again, condors, though they, obviously those animals aren't marine. The way I drew the wing membrane in our reconstruction perpetuated a misconception, it turns out. I, I drew it with this very deep, convex trailing edge to the membrane, and there's a few things going on there. I was trying to combine a couple different ways of reconstructing the membrane without actually understanding the reasoning behind them, which is bad. It is true that the distal, that is the outer 
wing phalanges would bend back when the wing is under tension, both bending at the knuckle and the outermost knuckle bone would bend within the bone itself because it wasn't totally mineralized. It was just calcified cartilage supported by columns of bone. There's even an animal called Bellabrunus that has a recurved wingtip bone that they think when the wing was under tension would bend straight. So that part, the, the leading edge of the wing is somewhat correct, but I drew it in such a way that the animal doesn't actually have its wing all the way extended. In flight, the wing would actually be swept forward a little bit to try to align the center of lift of the animal with the center of mass of the animal. Which means that even if we stick with the very high aspect ratio wing, where the wing is relatively narrow until it hits the elbow, which some workers do still favor, it wouldn't be this S-curved shape that I portrayed. The same authors who pointed out the wing sweep thing also think that the trailing edge of the membrane would have to be deeply concave. It gives the overall wing a, a crescent shape. They call it lunate. The reason is that it has to be very taut in order to prevent membrane flutter. I'm not sure I buy that. These animals seem to have had other sources of flutter prevention, even if the wing wasn't at its ideal shape. Which, if you think about it, they would have to because they're constantly adjusting their wing in flight and they have to, you know, flap. And there is a model for how that could work, but we have to do some anatomy first. We can subdivide the main wing membrane, the brachiopatagium, into regions of greater or lesser flexibility. The part near the body, where the arm and the leg are, uh, is primarily for lift and the part near the hand and the finger is primarily for thrust. We call the inboard portion the plagiopatagium, I think because that's the term we use for bats. This part is stretchier with thinner and shorter, more flexible actinofibrils. We call the outboard portion the dactylopatagium. This is tougher and it has longer, stiffer actinofibrils. For the record, both the propatagium, which runs from the hand to the shoulder, and the uropatagium, which runs from ankle to hip, have a similar structure to the dactylopatagium, but with more spaced out fibers, so they were probably more tensile. Some authors use different terms for the brachiopatagium zones, uh, tenopatagium and actinopatagium, and honestly I like those better because they say what they are. Plagio just means slanted, whereas teno means stretchy. Dactylo is a bit better because that is the finger part of the wing, but actino means the rayed part of the wing, and if you find one preserved, it does have rays in it. Also, plagiopatagium sometimes gets used to refer to the brachiopatagium as a whole, which is confusing on top of all this. Now, unlike bats, there is no sharp delineation between the inboard and outboard portion of the membrane, because obviously there's no finger there. I am curious if we ever get more details on the structure of scansoriopterygid membranes. You know, those animals are superficially more bat-like. I wonder if their membranes were structurally so. Anyway, without a finger or a wrist spar, you have this transitional zone where the fibrils are more spaced out than they are outboard, but longer than they are inboard. And where that transition happens can vary depending on where in the pterosaur family tree you are, even between relatively close relatives. Relatively close relatives. In some animals, like Aurorage Darko, it's out past the hand. In others, like Pterodactylus, it starts around the wrist. And in still others, like Aneurygnathus or Sordes, everything past the elbow is stiffened. Okay, what does all this have to do with my sins as far as the paddle wings? Well, reconstructing the shape of the membrane is an inference that is itself based on inferences. Wing membranes preserve very rarely, and when we have them, they tend to be the outer keratinized portion, the actinopatagium. We have a couple of specimens of the tenopatagium, maybe. Uh, and there's debate as to how this structure was actually put together. Now, the most straightforward function of the actinopatagium was to prevent damage to the membrane. Obviously, the outer portion of the wing is the part that is most likely to be hitting stuff, so it makes sense to have a bunch of keratin fibers in there reinforcing it. But the alignment of those actinofibrils affects how the membrane performs in an airstream. Near the wrist, 
ish, they are more cord-wise, roughly perpendicular to the bones. But then they gradually get more span-wise the further out you go, where they wind up basically parallel to the finger bones. Pittman and co-authors in 2022 synthesized a couple of theories about the function of this. When the wing is slack, the fibrils would load in tension, which would mitigate membrane flutter and be useful during an upstroke or when it's adjusting its span. When the wing is pulled taut, the fibrils would load in compression, and the ones near the tip would pack more tightly together. This redirects spanwise tension in the finger inboard towards the hand, which is useful in cruising flight. So, if I'm reading all of that correctly, and I might not be, if there was any convexity to the trailing edge of the membrane, it would be limited to where the fibrils are fanned out, only present when the wing is somewhat slack, and very slight. It would not be the giant flipper that I portrayed. There are some caveats here. We don't know how actinofibrils respond to compressive loads. We don't know how they scale up in giant pterosaurs. You know, intuitively, larger animals will have thicker hairs and larger scales, and actinofibrils appear to have been keratin structures possibly derived from scales. So does that mean that a pteranodon has much larger or, or wider actinofibrils than, say, a rampharynchus? Maybe, but we don't know. So basically everything I just said is only one possibility. <laughs> Welcome to Pterosaur Research! So in addition to messing up the posture of the wing finger, I think I messed up the posture of the other fingers. They would, in flight, be palm forward, for lack of a better term, or, or maybe like slightly down. I mentioned the propatagium earlier. Uh, I should have pointed out, it doesn't actually stop at the pteroid bone. The pteroid bone supports the membrane and possibly controls the membrane, but it probably extended as far as the knuckles. The case for webbed fingers and toes in Pteranodon is actually stronger than I made it sound. It's true we don't have direct trackway evidence from any Pteranodontid showing webbing, but we do have both more basal animals and more derived animals that both do show webbing. So we can actually bracket that one. We can say that the ancestral condition for Pteranodon would have been to have webbing. That observation I made about the muscle mass being more diffused into the arms was actually more important than I realized at the time. See, historically it had been argued that, you know, pterosaurs, they, they couldn't be strong flyers. They don't have any muscle mass. Look at, look at a bird's flight muscles. They're gigantic compared to a pterosaur's. Uh, not so. Pterosaurs were relying on much more than just their chest muscles. They had all the muscles of the arms and a bunch of muscles in the back contributing to the flight stroke. These animals did indeed have unidirectional breathing, though I should have pointed out that it was probably very different from what we see in birds, because pterosaurs seem to have acquired postcranial skeleton pneumaticity, you know, the, their bones showing spaces for air sacs, independently of some groups of dinosaurs acquiring it, and that's our only good skeletal correlate for an air sac system. Actually, even that varied between different pterosaur lineages. It seems that uh, Pteranodon and its relatives acquired air sacs in their arms independently from, like, Ejdarkids and their relatives. That said, only the air sacs in the thoracic cavity, in the chest and, and belly area, would actually be contributing to respiration. I, I kind of made it sound like it was breathing through its arms, which is not the case. <laughs> the visual I had of the pneumatic system of the animal was bizarre. I don't know why I segmented it the way that I did. It might have just been artistic license, but I think I was conflating a couple of ideas there. One is that a layer of the membrane itself would be pneumatized, which is disputed, but if true, it would only be this like sheet-like structure. It wouldn't be this large volume. What is not in dispute is that there would be a fibrous soft tissue wedge around the wing and wing finger bones. Uh, mostly behind them, supporting a air pocket. This was deepest around the elbow and then got thinner distally as the wing bones get thinner. And depending on how extensive that fairing was, this could have increased the aerodynamic efficiency and flight speed of the animal. 
I don't know what traces I was referring to. As far as I know, we have no pterodactyloid tracks for which Pteranodon is a plausible track maker. But that said, this animal's feet are pretty conservative morphologically, so basically any large pterodactyloid is going to be a good guide for Pteranodon. I just wish I knew where I got that claim from. <laughs> because of the large quantity of material, much of it well preserved, Pteranodon's skeleton has been pretty well understood for more than a century. The problems come from, on the research side, trying to understand flyers that are so different from living bats and birds, and on the toy making side, indifference or disregard for that same distinction. But that's, that's Pteranodon. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this look back. I hope that I cleared some stuff up and introduced some new problems to think about because that's what pterosaur research seems to do. But I want to thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong, and please remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. We would like to send a special thank you to these individuals who have gone above and beyond to support this show. We could not have done it without you. Thank you.